My name is Marianne, and I am a grateful alcoholic today. I am recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of body, mind, spirit. Thank God for this program of AA. You know, before I was even born, I was one of us. Both of my parents were into drugs and alcohol. I was born in 1966. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, and, um, you know, so I never felt like I was good enough even before I was born because I wasn't wanted. So I was born, and back then they really didn't understand, um, you know, little kids being addicted to alcohol. And I was placed in a foster home um, by the nuns. And um, my foster parents, uh, I guess, did their best, but they also um, didn't know what to do with me. So, you know, I was born at six pounds and um, they were feeding me alcohol to try to appease me and, and stop me from crying. At nine months old, um, I should have been probably 28 pounds. When my parents got me, I was 12 pounds. So, um, you know, wasn't the best in the world, shall I say. But then I, I proceeded to cry for over a week and a half when my parents got me and they didn't know what was going on. So fast forward, now I'm getting fed good, which is good. I obviously got rid of the alcohol out of my body. Um, but my mom and dad went to a cocktail party one day and I had started walking at nine months. So I was probably about a year old, maybe a year and a little bit. And I was walking around and I was thirsty and there was a cocktail table that was low and I picked up somebody's cocktail and downed it. That is not normal behavior for somebody at that at that age. I mean, if anybody that age was to consume alcohol, the first thing they'd do is spit it out and go Bleh! But no, I drank it and proceeded to get drunk and everyone laughed at me. So obviously, it was in me. Um, I didn't drink until I was 13. I went to a New Year's Eve party and somebody gave me um, Southern Comfort in my Coca-Cola. Now, I was already, you know, didn't feel part of, uh, you know, all of these fears and everything. So when I took that first drink, I was just like, oh, for a while it, it felt good. I felt part of, I felt prettier I felt you know this belonging well honestly right after this all happened um, I can't even remember how much I drank that night but I was told that I passed out hit my head on one of those poles in a basement knocked one of my contacts out threw up all over my long hair because it was longer than it is now turned purple and blue um, so obviously I had alcohol poisoning um, next day I slept it off nobody said anything about it it would have been nice if somebody had said something about alcohol but I was never really um, told about alcohol and anything that alcohol could happen to you. I was very sheltered with my parents. So I didn't have this incredible desire to go do it again, like some people do. Um, but when I was 16, I tried it again and I had two beers. And by this time I had gone through um, a horrific incident. I was raped at 16. I started, I essentially switched addictions at that point I became anorexic and you know was five foot six 72 pounds I drank two beers and it was a scene from you know uh, one of the movies 
you know, I'm holding, trying to walk home and I'm holding a telephone pole to stand up. They threw me in a shopping cart and brought me home. And you know what movie I'm talking about. Um, I did not drink after that, but my anorexia was in full bloom, full blown. Um, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. They wanted to put an IV in me just to keep me alive. I was able to get over that, but, um, you know, I had abandonment issues. I never felt good enough. You know, the fear of rejection, fear of losing my family because I was always afraid that they were going to take me away from my parents, fear of dying from anorexia, fear of being blamed all the time, fear of being abused, fear of depression, because I suffered a lot of depression and anxiety. You know, fear of being judged, failure, not fitting in. You know, the, the kids in school were really cruel to me. Um, never fit in with any of the groups. So I hung out with the Brainiacs and the, and the, the Stoners. It was just a weird combina- combination. But I had a fierce determination. And my fierce determination was I was going to become a nurse. So I went to school, I became a nurse, everything was great. I got married, I did what I thought I was supposed to do. Um, Right from the get-go, I ignored red flags with the husband I was supposed to marry. Um, I painted them green, you know, because I was used to all of this stuff happening to me. It was like, okay, whatever, you know, I can deal with this. So I got married, had two kids, and everything was going all right, but I never felt accepted from his family either, you know, and my kids never felt his family as as well. So it was really, you know, very, very hard. But I wasn't drinking at this point. So my my ex-husband started to hurt me and be mentally, physically, mentally abusive. And um, I had a friend's father that said, well, here's a couple bottles of wine. When he starts to do that, have a couple of drinks before he came home from work and, you know, you'd be able to deal with that. Well, that wasn't such a good idea because I didn't realize the alcoholism was just laying dormant in my body. Very, very quickly, I became addicted to alcohol, became a full-fledged alcoholic. The only thing that alcohol ever did for me was give me enough confidence to get a divorce from this gentleman, which I did do. Um, I did crash and burn in two years. Um, You know, they say, do you know when you cross that line? Well, I sort of know when I crossed that line. I was at a camping trip and I would have to steal beers from people's coolers so that I could stop the shakes in order to get out of the, the tent in the morning to take care of my two small children and um, also get home from that camping trip. And, and that started my journey to rehabs and detoxes. Um, I went right there from there to my first detox, and, and that was in 2002. Um, at this point, I was divorced. My ex-husband was trying to take my kids. Um, I was in a, um, an outpatient treatment. Uh, the judge looked at me and um, noticed that my ex-husband wasn't the best husband or father, I should say. Um, He neglected the children and um, his actions said to the, made the judge say to him and myself that if I don't get sober, the kids are not going to him, they're going to go to foster care and that I didn't want. So with that, I went into rehab actually sober. Um, came out and 
I did stay sober. I started working a program of recovery, not the program of recovery. Um, the person that I had to bring me through the the 12 steps was not really bringing me tr- through the 12 steps. It was um, their program, not the program. So I only had only half the recipe for success. So I was able to keep myself sober um, for uh, 10 years um, or nine years, something like that. And I never realized that I had a reservation. My reservation was if anything happened to my kid, um, I might drink. Well, my daughter was uh, killed in a horrible uh, car accident in 2011. I had that reservation. It took me nine nine months, eight months in order to pick up that drink. Um, I tried to reach out for help um, to doctors, um, but it, the ball was already in motion because I had that reservation there. Um, so I was in and out and in and out of the program, just going to meetings, going to detoxes, going, get this crap out of me. I don't want it in me. You know, having a belly full of booze and, you know, somewhat of the program of AA, I knew that alcohol was not really the solution and it was killing me. Absolutely killing me. Um, you know, the progression of this de- disease in me just took me to places that, you know, it got really bad. It got really bad. Um, you know, I was drinking beer and wine and then I decided that vodka was a good idea and that really took me to my knees quick. Um, you know, to think that it's a good idea because of the obsession and the craziness in your freaking mind because you want that alcohol because it's controlling you that in the middle of the night in a terrible snowstorm in 20 degree weather to walk two miles to go get beer and walk back home and sneak back in the house was a good idea that's not a good idea that's the insanity of this disease and I was fighting the program fighting myself Fighting God, um, alcohol really, really, as they said, had me over the barrel. I was hopeless and helpless. I mean, I found myself in s- terrible situations where I would pass out and end up in the hospital, not knowing how I got there. And, um, you know, in one instance, Uh, They released me. I was waiting for a taxi. And who did I sit down next to? Another alcoholic who had little nips in his bag. So what did I do? I was still coming off the alcohol, took a couple nips and went home. I mean, that's the insanity of this disease. You know, normal people would say, oh, my God, what did I do? And, And never do that again. But, you know, alcoholics, we just keep going, unfortunately. Ah, oh, so honesty, open-minded, and willingness. I had the willingness to try this program. I had to be open to the program. And honesty is one thing that I was lacking because I kept thinking I could do it my way. Well, my, my way never worked. My reliance on myself never worked. Um... You know, I held those those skeletons in my closet. I was never going to tell anybody. Well, those skeletons are bad things to leave there because they jump out and get you. So my last um, time drinking, again, you know, guilt, shame, remorse, self-loathing, made myself feel like shit yet again because I was supposed to um, take care of my daughter's dog and be responsible and 
yet again, my neighbor is now taking care of my dog, making sure that I'm alive. And when I finally came to from my um, debacle with alcohol that time, I had bottles and boxes of wine and, and I'm, I'm laying in my, my own pee because that's what we do and I'm all sweaty and disgusting and I'm shaking and baking in bed and I just, that was the day. I said, God, I don't know what you want me to do, but whatever you want me to do, just show me, I'll do it because I can't live like this anymore. And that was the day, believe it or not, that I never wanted a drink after that. God relieved me of that obsession that day. I found the program the way the program is laid out. I found great people to show me the right way of this program. I got a beautiful sponsor to take me through the steps. And I didn't sit on the steps. I ran through the steps. And I ran with enthusiasm. I had fierce determination to get this program. And damn it, with God's help, I was going to get it. I had to smash. Right then and there, I smashed any thought that I could drink again. Give me a beautiful glass vase. I smashed that thing on the ground. You can't put that thing back together and have it hold water. It was done. I had no more reservations, no more lurking notions that I could do it again. Alcohol was just something to deal with my pain, my fears, my emotions. But when I finally got down to looking at where they were coming from and how I was hurting myself, I was able to get better. So right then and there, I did steps one, two, and three. I looked at myself in step four and saw that you know, all of these things were right there in the beginning before I drank, before I knew it. And with God's help, I could get, ri get rid of most of them. They're not all gone. They come back. And then I go, oops, no, nope, go away. You know, God can, can get me through anything. You know, I, I have to bring the shovel, shovel, but I need God's help. So I asked God to help remove these things from me that were blocking me off from the spirit of his sunlight. He is in me. I have a God conscience now. I had to apologize to the people that I hurt while I was drinking, especially my children and one who was gone. I couldn't apologize to her in person, but I apologized to her in my heart and at her grave. Step 10, I do every day. Step 10 for me is what I call my antivirus software. You know, we have our computers, the antivirus software is in there working in the background. And when a virus comes up or a shortcoming or a fear or an action that I'm going to start because of my fears, it comes in and says, whoa, stop. Where is this coming from? God, help me to get rid of this fear. Some days, you know, it is just pause, pray, proceed. Some days things are so bad that it's like I'm on fire. So when, you, when you're on fire, sometimes it's, you know, you got to stop, drop, and roll got to put out that fire then I can pause I can pray and sometimes those things have to be put on a box because I don't have the time to 
to deal with them correctly or it's not the right time to address somebody. I have to wait until I'm in the right spiritual condition to go forward with um, talking to somebody or doing um, something to, to get over what that problem is. I pray every day to be helpful to those about me in and outside of AA and to do the right thing. You know, today God is my GPS. I have to drive the bus, but God will tell me which direction to go in. Sometimes I don't like the direction he wants me to go in and I go, okay, God, I don't understand this, but all right, we'll go that way. And working with others, step 12, carrying this message to other people is such a pleasure for me. I never got the message correctly. And by not giving the, the message correctly to people kills people. So I try to carry this message, the message in our big book to other people in the program. I try to be of service to AA online with my groups. And I try to be the best person that I can be every single day to people outside of the program. Um, AA is a recipe to make an absolutely beautiful, fantastic, good tasting cake. The problem is people like to take it the way they want to take it like I did. I'll take this ingredient, that ingredient, blah, blah, blah. Well, my cake never tasted too good. And I didn't get the recovery that God wanted me to have. Um, so jump into this program like I did. Two feet, don't look back. Take the gift of this program that was 